I'm Aaron Porras, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Prime Minister Netanyahu demands a full pardon for former soldier Elor Azaria. Jordan releases the identity of the Israeli embassy guard from last week's crisis. And get ready to get moving because Israeli company Waze is helping usher in the smart car era. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. The Israeli courts just made a huge decision in a very controversial case. A military judge has denied the appeal of Elor Azaria, upholding the manslaughter charges and sticking to the 18-month sentence. And now Prime Minister Netanyahu has joined the voice of Azaria's defenders, turning to Facebook to say that he will recommend a full presidential pardon for Azaria from President Reuven Rivlin. Azaria was convicted earlier this year for killing an incapacitated Palestinian assailant while he was an IDF soldier stationed in the West Bank city of Hebron. Video footage of the incident went viral, though, throwing the case into the global spotlight. Shockwaves from the court's rejection of the appeal are being felt all over Israel again, dividing politicians and po populations alike. Azaria's lawyer made his thoughts on the decision quite clear after the verdict came in. Meanwhile, the father of Abdel Fattah al-Sharif, the unarmed Palestinian that Azaria shot in the head, is feeling neither phased nor appeased by the court's decision. When the verdict came in, al-Sharif's father was busy at work at his construction day job in the West Bank. And he says that he's just shocked the court didn't clear Azaria's charges altogether. Azaria's lawyers now face the difficult decision of how to proceed with the case. They can file another appeal and take his trial all the way to the Israeli Supreme Court, or they can let Azaria begin serving his jail time, which is the only way he can obtain a presidential pardon. The Jordanian media has just made public the identity of the Israeli security guard involved in the killing of two Jordanians at the Israeli embassy last week. News sites have published a picture of the guard's diplomatic ID card, revealing the photo and name of 28-year-old Ziv Moyal. Moyal shot and killed a Jordanian teenager who had stabbed him with a screwdriver at the embassy compound, killing a nearby Jordanian bystander in the crossfire too. The incident has ignited an international conflict that continues to worsen. The guard and the entire embassy staff was allowed to return to Israel after an intense day of diplomatic talks, but shortly after, Jordan charged the guard with two counts of murder and announced they wouldn't reopen the Israeli embassy until Israel prosecuted the guard in court. Worse still, now that the guard's name is out, his family fears for retribution attacks. Following everything that's happened in the Temple Mount over the last two weeks, this is one crisis that's coming at a very tense time in Israeli-Jordanian relations. A private media group in Iran is claiming the Israeli army just made a surprise attack in Syria. They're now accusing Israel of attacking a shipment of entertainment equipment on its way to an event in Aleppo. Here with the story is ILTV's Brett Allen Smith. Brett, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, tell me, what are the implications behind this? Well, this report's coming to us from a non-government organization in Iran. It's a media group called OJ. And they're saying that Israel made an attack on a shipment of their own supplies, media supplies, for what they're calling an entertainment event in Aleppo. So what this means is, if this is true, then clearly the IDF has a lot more in store in uh, in Iran and Syria than just uh, military targets. Interesting. It's, we're going to have to, it's very interesting to see how that's going to play out. So yeah. let's, uh, let's turn to your report. The alleged attack first surfaced on Arabic social media networks over the weekend, claiming the IDF launched an attack at the Damascus International Airport. And now the Iran-based media group Aush is saying this was an attack on a supply of their, quote, entertainment equipment, allegedly on its way to Aleppo for an unspecified entertainment event. It's important to know that Aush is not an official government organization. They're more involved with making propaganda, as well as overseeing the production of films and their release in Iran. But their relationship with factions of Iran's army is practically an open secret. 
Syrian President Bashar al-Assad usually takes every opportunity to publicize Israeli attacks in Syria, even attacks that they can't entirely confirm. But in this case, Assad's government has refrained from confirming reports of this attack published by Auj, along with the rest of the Arab media. So this is a very interesting insight into the way these media factions operate with Iran and Syria. And if what Auj is saying is true, it indicates Israel may have a more involved strategy for targets beyond strictly military targets. So Israel removed the last of its security measures following almost two weeks of unrest at the Temple Mount, and prayers have finally returned to the Al-Aqsa Mosque as normal. But thousands in Istanbul are now rallying against Israel, many calling for an end to Israel's control over Jerusalem altogether. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan has been very vocal about his outrage over Israel's handling of the Temple Mount situation. Even after Israel took down the metal detectors, Erdogan publicly threatened that Israel would continue to suffer the worst of the consequences. Israel's responsibility is to Filistin'in ve Filistinlilerin haklarına gösterdiği saygı ölçüsünde anlamlıdır. Özellikle Kudüs'ün üç din içinde özel olan statüsüne hele hele Mescid-i Aksa'nın ve Kubbetü Sahra'nın içinde bulunduğu harem bölgesinin mahremiyetine saygı duymayan bir İsrail en büyük zararı kendisinin göreceği tehlikeli bir yola sapıyor demektir. Israel had installed the additional security after three Arab Israelis murdered two Israeli cops with guns they had smuggled at the Temple Mount. But the Muslim world erupted into rage and boycotts over the move, giving us some of the bloodiest clashes between Israelis and Palestinians in years. Things may be back to normal at the Temple Mount now, where thousands of Muslims continue to pray at the holy site, but in Turkey, anger only appears to be mounting. Thousands of protesters flooded the streets of Istanbul, waving Palestinian and Turkish flags, singing a rally that included the words, quote, hit, hit Zionists, end quote. And many are calling for an end to Israeli jurisdiction. Looks like it may take longer for the dust to settle from the Temple Mount crisis. Speaking of the Temple Mount, for those who don't know, tonight is said to be the saddest day in the Jewish religion, Tisha B'Av, and, and it commemorates major calamities that have befallen the Jewish people, like the destruction of the first and second temples, for example. Here in the studio to tell us more is Rabbi Ronan Neuwirth, the president of the Ve'ahavta Tel Aviv Jewish Experience. Thank you so much for coming in uh, and joining us today on this Thank day. You. Uh, so I hope that we're not cutting too much into into your fast later. It is sorry uh, that you're preparing. You know, preparing nicely. So tell me, what are the calamities? What are these? What are these things that we are so sad about today? So obviously, as you mentioned, the two destructions of the the temples. But the first uh, first catastrophe that took place on that day was the scene of the spies, uh, which was the. Uh, uh, unwillingness of the people to enter the land of Israel and therefore they had to be in the desert for 40 years and the entire generation uh, did not marry to enter the land of Israel. So, so, traveling, so traveling for 40 years in the desert was a punishment? Yeah, it was a punishment for the sin of the spies, which took place on Tisha B'Av. That's the first okay. event that took place on Tisha B'Av, uh, which again I think it symbolizes um, all the destructions are in a, the wrong choices that we made, made as a nation. Uh, okay. Many times God has given us the, the opportunity, the chance, uh, but we, we missed out. That's what happened in the desert. And that's what happened when, he, when we had the two temples, which are uh, each destruction. It's not just a destruction of the religious place. It's a destruction. It's, it's the beginning of the exile. The first well, I mean, so, okay. So do, all, do the calamities have a theme, or it's just like really terrible things that happen to the Jewish people? The most terrible things. The most also, terrible. So yeah. it's not. It's not like you know, in the because in the first one, the the spies who came back, and you're saying that was a punishment that we had to wander the desert for forty years. We couldn't enter the land. Of and Israel. the entire generation. Uh, so were the first two temples punishments as well? Uh, there were punishments on the sins of the people, uh, based on. Uh, uh, basically, uh, according to our sages, the first temple was destroyed because of the war scenes of adultery, of bloodshed, of killing each other, uh, idol worshipping. The second one, however, and that's, by the way, the biggest destruction for 2,000 years, uh, was destroyed because of baseless, baseless hatred, because Jews hated it, uh, each other, fought, fought against each other, did not know how to respect. People were very, in that sense, observant in that time, but uh, the discourse was so... Mm -hmm. 
hateful and so violent, and that's, that's a destruction. Unfortunately, uh, if you're speaking about the relevancy of uh, mourning in our times, um, I, I think we're mourning not just over the temple, but most importantly, because of the reasons that led to the destruction for 2,000 years. And unfortunately, we are still repeating the very same mistakes. Uh, the, uh, the hatred, the violent discourse that we have in Israeli society today, the inability to listen, to respect, even to respectfully disagree. Uh, we don't have to agree, but there has to be a different discourse. And yeah, I think this is something we, we need. Well, yeah. much more respect, we don't have to, to agree, but we need to listen. And this is something, especially today, uh, just before entering Tisha B'Av, I think all of us, it's not a religious thing. It's, uh, I wrote on my Facebook page that every, I think everybody should fast, not as a religious uh, uh, practice, but as a, an awakening call. And let's not repeat the same mistake. Let's love each other, let's listen. We can disagree, we have different opinions, it's fine, but we can work together as one nation, one people. That's a beautiful thought, and I couldn't agree more. Um, but speaking of the fast, so what, what are the other ways that we are supposed to commemorate? How do we observe this holiday? Holiday, if you could call it a holiday. Uh, yeah. by, by the way, uh, it's interesting because it has an aspect of holy day. Uh, right. It's called Moed. Moed is like also a holy day. Uh, mm -hmm. in, the, the, in the Eicha, in, in Megillah, it says, Karalai Moed, Lishbo Bachwai. Uh, there's an aspect of uh, mm -hmm. kind of holy day because uh, it's a sad day, but when we are able to meet, uh, you know, the essence of life, to uh, stop, for instance, uh, for stop for a second, uh, you know, everything, the, the mundane, and be able to reconnect to our, to our it's soul. Like it's like a day of reflection, exactly. more than it is a day of sadness, possibly. It's, a, it's, it's sadness but that helps you to look right. inside to remember what are the, the you know, th the mistakes right. that we did in the past, that we do in the present, and uh, to fight against, um, be, just being, uh, stop being apathetic. Just, and just while, so, and then in the last few moments, unfortunately, we have to wrap this up, but in the last few moments, other than the fast, we have to, we have to do what? Yeah, so uh, basically we are not eating and not, no drinking. Uh, it's like Yom Kippur. Uh, uh, the other uh, prohibitions are, uh, not to wash ourselves, not to wear leather shoes. Uh, uh, there are other um, uh, other customs right. of not not greeting with uh, shalom until noon uh, tomorrow time. Uh, we do not sit on chairs. That, that's many many so morning. Yeah, but again, all these customs are supposed to serve as an awakening call to uh, remind us of the mistakes of the past and to uh, help us mm -hmm. to improve our ways and be, right. become better, well, better Rabbi people. Newer, good luck with the fast, good luck in improving and on reflection and I hope everybody takes a moment to reflect just like you said, uh, even in a non-religious way. I think that's a really great thing. And thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Right. Should have so to vote. North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper has just signed a bill barring his state from doing business with organizations that boycott Israel. That means North Carolina now joins 21 other states in the union, legalizing punishment to companies that uh, participate in the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign against the Jewish state. The bill passed the North Carolina Senate and House of Congress with a commanding majority of both votes. Karen Saville of the Jewish Federation of Raleigh Carey praised the bill's passage, and Skip Schreier from the Israel Action Network thanked Governor Roy Cooper on behalf of Jewish federations all over the state. The passing of this bill into law is also critical good news for businesses in North Carolina, as the state does close to $140 million worth of business a year with Israel in exports and commerce. The governor's signature now means that state agencies will be required to divest from and prohibited completely from contracting with any companies that participate in the BDS boycott of Israel. State governments all over the United States have been giving more and more attention to the boycott as the BDS movement continues to impact Israeli-American relations as well as business. An Israeli startup called Energene has just made a breakthrough that may mean healthier, better crops. After breaking the genetic code for bread, pasta, and wild emmer wheat last year, Energene has now mapped the genome for cotton and the sweet potato. Energene CEO Gil Ronen believes the discovery will be the future of cotton and sweet potato growth for generations to come. Ronen says that now that scientists can fully analyze the genome, it means that, quote, breeders can develop more nutritious, high-yielding varieties with fewer resource requirements, end quote. Energene is based in Israel and partnered with the Chinese company Genesis Inc., which distributes genomic technologies to China. 
and to crack the code of upland cotton, which makes up to 90% of all the world's cotton growth. This is a code scientists have been trying to crack for years, a process that's cost millions of dollars in the past, so this is a major breakthrough that's going to have a global impact on both kinds of green, dollars, and plants. Energene also broke the sweet potato genome with help from scientists in Japan, China, and Korea, with demand for food expected to jump at least 20% in the next 15 years. This couldn't have come at a more crucial time. The Israeli Justice Ministry has taken hemp off the official list of legally dangerous drugs, and now hemp is about to make its first comeback after 75 years of being banned from the Holy Land. The Department of Agriculture has just announced a pilot program to grow hemp all over Israel. Hemp, of course, comes from cannabis, although the strain contains only 0.3% of any psychoactive material. It's been on the illegal substance list in Israel, and police have been especially reluctant to approve its legalization because it's so difficult to distinguish between the industrial plant and the actual drug. But increased studies of the health benefits of cannabis and cannabis oils in Israel, facilitated by softened criminalization of the substance, have led to a series of medical breakthroughs over the last few years. Police have actually seized over three tons of cannabis plants grown illegally in a greenhouse in the Negev, but the government's new stance on punishment means no criminal charges will be brought against the offenders, since this is their first offense. The first ever known production of Israeli hemp happened in 1942 in Kibbutz Dafna. At the time, the makers were hopeful that hemp, which generated tarpaulin, rope, clothes, and all kinds of oils and byproducts, would eventually flourish into its own massive industry to aid the birth of the Jewish state. Obviously, the illegalization of cannabis has put a stop to those things, but now the Agricultural Ministry's year-long program will grow hemp in all kinds of environments across Israel. That means we probably won't have to wait very long to see all kinds of hemp, which for now will include Arava, Lachish, and Golan hemp. Parenting has always been a complex and difficult task, but in today's world of interconnectivity and anonymous digital actions, that task has become even harder. Well now, with one incredible app, you'll be able to breathe a lot easier. Joining me now in the studio to tell us why is Inon Landenberg, the founder and dad of the Bosco app. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. So tell me, first of all, you call yourself the dad of the Bosco app. Right. Why is that? I think it's uh, more rational uh, to be a dad than a CEO or, or any other official title because uh, what we're trying to do is actually help parents. And we are all parents that are developing this app. Uh, and uh, running it, so uh, we so, all have... So tell me about the app, what does it do? How does it work? So, you know, our, our purpose is to give parents more peace of mind about what's happening with their kids while, while saving their privacy. We don't want to show a mirror of what's happening on their phone, we want to update the parents only when they need to be updated and when they need to be alerted. So it's an app that uh, is installed on the kid's phone, uh, not presenting what's happening on the phone to the parents, but just alerting when something dramatic happens, like we're starting from a, a local uh, information, GPS-based. Uh, whenever the kid enters home or leaves school, we update the parents so they don't need to call the kid and ask him where he is. Of course, they can see where he is every time. Uh, we are uh, analyzing their battery status, so whenever the battery is less than 15%, we update the parents so they, you know, whenever we need our kids, uh, their, their battery is dead. Uh, we are uh, analyzing the tone of voice of the kid when he's speaking on the phone and uh, updating the parent when the kid is terrified, when he's in a Man. good mood. We're uh, um, analyzing the social media presence of the kid, and whenever more than three friends unfriended the kid, we update the parent, which is an, a, a symbol for a, for a cyberbullying attack sure, on the that kid. Could be, that could, that's uh, a flag. We analyze, uh, of course, all the images that go through the kid's phone, uh, whatever he, he took a picture or received a picture, and looking for uh, nudity and updating when uh, he sent or received nude images without showing the picture, so just I'm, directing the parent to it. So that's it. So I know you, you, and you just said that you're not sending the actual picture and you're not sending the actual mirror copy of the right. phone. Um, but doesn't, I mean, doesn't this kind of break down some sort of security between you and your kids or some sort of trust barrier? Doesn't this break any sort of line? Doesn't this cross a line? Uh, I don't, I don't know what line, you're, what line you're talking about, because when we take our kids in the car, we make them uh, put a seat belt, and when they're mm -hmm. riding their bicycle, we make them put a, a helmet. Uh, and we're constantly trying to keep them from all kinds of threats, uh, especially in the young, younger ages, till the age of 14, 15, 16, when they don't know what's right or wrong. Uh, they need to have more support. Uh, the threats on our kids in the last 20 years grew dramatically. We have 
10 times more cars in the streets. We have 10 times more pedophiles uh, connected to our kids on social media. And we have much more threats for our kids that we can't analyze because we don't see them. You know, my dad knew all my mm -hmm. friends because everyone that wanted to come to visit me had to call my landline and talk with my dad and say, Inon's dad, we want to come to Inon. And then he knew who came. Today, kids are in my door and I ask them, why, why are you here? You say, we have a meeting with your son and uh, they're coming to my son. They set a meeting Sounds on very WhatsApp or <laughs> whatever. So yeah, play date. <laughs> so uh, so uh, definitely we need to, to use these uh, tools that uh, some of them are the threats themselves to analyze the threats, of course. That's, wow. So how, so what inspired the creation of this technology? I mean, your own kids? Yeah, I have three kids. Uh, Roy, Leah, and Zoe, and uh, I noticed that they are going through different difficulties. Uh, I, I noticed, you know, when I was bullied in school, I came back home and I had a relief until the following day. Today, when they are bullied in school, they come back home and the cyberbullying uh, starts to work. So, yeah, definitely, they don't have a relief. I, I can tell you more than that. You know, in the, my mother used to wait for me at home when I came back after school. Today, moms want a career, they want to work, and they, are mm. not, they don't see and feel their kids. So we need to help them uh, get more information. Again, you need to be the best mother and father in the world, definitely. Right. But you need some help. So, okay, so then my final question is, where is it available? It's available uh, everywhere. You Worldwide? Can download, yeah, you can download it from the app stores of uh, Android and uh, iOS for parents. Kids, we're still operating only for Android but this is most of the market. Right. Uh, we are operating in a lot of languages like uh, English, Hebrew, Chinese, wow. Japanese, it's Indonesian, incredible. French, Italian, and more and more every two weeks, we're adding another language. Well, and and on, uh, yeah. And on, thank you so much. Keeping the kids safe, thank you thank so much. You so much thank you so much, sir. Thank you, I appreciate it. It is about to get a whole lot easier to get wherever you're going. The Israeli-founded Waze app just launched Waze for Android Auto and it's about to come built in with Google's Android-driven car navigation systems in millions of cars. In fact, cars with built-in Waze are already on the market. Google launched its Android Auto app in 2014, which came pre-installed in cars compatible with Android systems. Now, Waze is integrating its globally popular navigation system with Google's app, introducing Waze to millions of drivers on the road. Waze was created in 2007 by Israeli founders Ehud Shabtai, Amir Shinar, and Uri Levine, and landed a major sale with Google in 2013 for over a billion dollars. The app's popularity has only flourished since. Integrating simple design with real-time GPS and user data that creates a living, breathing map of the road, Waze's Android Auto app will also streamline all its features for built-in car navigation screens. This means larger fonts, reorganized menus, and fewer overall options on screen so as to create the clearest map possible. If your car doesn't have an Android-based system, you'll need to pay to upgrade the system. But if you own a GM, then you're already in luck. Just make the switch in your car settings from Google Maps and join millions of Wazers all over the world. Enroll in eTeacher's online Hebrew courses and quickly discover that it creates the deepest connection to Israel that you could ever imagine. And now for our Hebrew word of the day, we just talked about the latest version of Waze hitting cars all over the world, and that brings us to today's word, lechaven, which means to lead or to direct. So there's a totally different word if you're talking about directing a film, levayem, but you could say a film director knows how to lechaven or lead an actor on the set. You could also say that a good role model will lechaven you in the right kivun or direction, and of course, as the saying goes, you can always lechaven a horse to water, but that doesn't always mean that you can make him wash the dishes. Ethan. And finally, if you're lucky, like I am when I'm freaking out over hitting deadlines, you can tell your friends to lechavenoti or point me back to planet Earth. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear but warm with a low of 78 or 26 degrees Celsius. And tomorrow is expected to have a little change from today with hot sun in the sky and a high of 90 or 32 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.56 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. I'm Aaron Porras, and thank you so much for watching.